When I'm not bringing a new meaning to the question, does the carpet match the drapes? I like to answer questions I get on YouTube, so let's get to it. Since you totally forgot this one, I reiterate, what do you think makes a riff heavy? What are the elements that contribute to the heavy sound? I was wondering about that. To me, it's not how much the tuning is dropped or how much distortion you put on. In fact, I find most of the modern metal stuff fake heavy. To me, one of the heaviest riffs ever written is Black Dog by Zeppelin. Another heavy riff is Muse Knights of Sidonia. Right after the first sit no one's gonna take me alive part, am I alone here in this train of thought? What do you think, maestro? I think you're right on, and I think the heaviness of a riff should be able to come across on acoustic guitar, electric guitar, whatever kind of distortion uh, you wanna do. I know a lot of people kind of think of heavy with like really, like you said, down-tuned guitars, super heavy distortion. But when it comes down to it, I think it's more of like the composition of a riff. Like the ones you mentioned specifically, Black Dog. <laughs> has its own rhythm. And the same with Knights of Sidonia. It's kind of like that, that galloping sound. And to me, there's kind of two schools of thought on that. It's like really the sound of kind of minor scale intervals. Uh, those two happen to have chromatic walks. A lot of the time, a lot of Muse's riffs uh, have chromatic walks. I think the riffs are really heavy. But I think it is kind of imparting a percussive element into a simple singable rhythm. I think the other side of that, which is still like a, a good riff writing thing for me, like one of the great riffs of all time, uh, is like a relentless nature. So I think those are kind of like two kind of schools of thought for what, what I think makes a heavy riff. Either just kind of like a relentless on, onslaught, like Crazy Train, Plug In Baby by Muse, or just kind of like that slow, just kind of like heaviness, even like a... Like that's just kind of like a heavy power riff, and I think so much of it is a few amount of notes, that's why the minor pentatonic scale is the most riffable scale, because it's everything that's like glorious about the minor scale, but consolidated into some kind of rhythmic, percussive way of playing. I think Jimmy Page is the greatest riff writer of all time, and again, that value for Muse I think is definitely up there. Uh, and I think a lot of it is just because, you know, the the synergy between Jimmy Page and John Bonham and kind of how they play off each other, how those guitar riffs just land with like a nasty percussive drum track. So I do think that there is, for again, for just my definition of what makes a heavy riff, there is that kind of connection that you make percussively, which why some of the great riff writing bands Again, all in my opinion, have great drummers along with great guitar players, and I think they kind of like combine to make like just like a cool percussive attack. Because like I said, a riff should be singable, it should be just like kind of like an attacking thing that you can kind of feel, and I think a lot of that comes from just like the percussive nature of just playing a select few notes, or just kind of like a range of notes, and then just really just like hammering them home, knocking them out. How and what did you practice a guitar when you were playing for about a year or two? I think the first or second year of playing was probably when I made like the biggest like increase, like the, the most progress on the instrument in general. Uh, and a lot of that was like, that was purely my Led Zeppelin phase. I listened to really nothing but Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix. I tried playing nothing but Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix. Sometimes I would kind of like dabble in like the alt rock of the time. But again, that would be like, when I was 18, 19 years old, it was seriously just like the Zeppelin uh, four disc compilation with like the actual Zeppelin over the cornfield uh, CD package that I had. And the same with the, the Hendrix Purple Experience Velvet Crushed Box Set that I had. Really, I had like a, like a pretty sweet six disc CD changer in my car at the time. And at any one point, all six of those, those discs were either Zeppelin or Hendrix. So that's all I listened to, that's all I played. And that's why I kind of feel like so much of my influence was just from there because that's all I was listening to at that developmental time in my guitar playing. Now, not to say that I was playing Zeppelin or Hendrix well at the point, at that point, but uh, really that's just kind of what I was playing. So even if you're just starting out uh, and maybe you're like, oh, like I'm a big Hendrix fan or whatever, I'm a big Ghost fan or whatever band Mastodon that you're into, really just try playing stuff that's way above your level. Because even if you're playing a version of it and uh, 10 years from now, you'll look back and like, wow, I was playing those really poorly. Like just jump right into it. Play stuff that's like really hard. 
And uh, I think that's just a great way to challenge yourself and just kind of humble yourself and be like, all right, well, I've only been playing six months or a year. I'm going to suck anyways. I might as well suck trying to play with really cool stuff instead of playing like super basic songs. So uh, yeah, I was a Zeppelin, Hendrix guy, still am. Sean, any advice or maybe a video on how to best avoid screeching noises caused by the fretting hand? I can't seem to get rid of them when I'm sliding from one fret to another. I've tried adjusting pressure and angle, but nothing's worked so far. So uh, this is more of an acoustic guitar question. That kind of sliding from one chord or one part to another. Number one thing, just get coated strings. I'm a big fan of elixirs, and that is the number one reason why. Because having coated strings is going to minimize a lot of the string noise, any kind of coated strings, or even some of the treated strings that you'll see, it's really gonna just get rid of that because to a certain extent, string noise is always going to be, I don't know if it's an issue, but it's always gonna be there on an acoustic set of strings. But the coated ones are the ones you wanna get, and that's one of the reasons why they're more expensive is because there's a little bit more that goes into the manufacturing of them, but they do last longer. I'm a huge fan of coated strings. That is one of a few reasons why and uh, you know as far as like if you're playing open chords i guess the one thing that you can try to practice if that's still not doing the trick is to really just work on the release of of your fingers now it's almost kind of counterproductive because you don't want to take your fingers off the fretboard because then you're going to have like a lot of just open string noise but you know, if you just focus on the release of where you're going to the next thing, maybe you can kind of minimize that. Maybe you can mute some of uh, some of that with your fretting hand. But honestly, I, I really personally see that as more of a type of string that you're using. And so just try a different set out and see how that works. What a crap does not deliver what it promises. Somebody salty that I have somehow reneged on the binding contract of any YouTube tutorial video that promises they will understand exactly what is going on. It's also going to be at the exact speed for their particular type of learning with the exact examples that they want. So I'm really sorry, but you're entitled to a refund. Beginner question, digital amps are getting better and better. Yes, with all the gear effects now built into the amps, what place is there for pedals? If you like the tone of an amp, is the sole purpose of a pedal to switch effects while playing? All the options seem overwhelming when really I just want a nice clean tone, a nice distortion. Shall I brace myself for an endless search? I should really be practicing instead. I mean, guitar pedals are the ultimate rabbit hole of just going down and getting obsessed with something. And you're right, digital effects are getting better and better, albeit digital effects that are built into an amp almost seem kind of just like a, a preset roulette that you can kind of tweak a little bit. I think the menu diving, I haven't really seen a digital amp where the menu diving isn't just like something that I don't really want to be involved in. And I do think that like with analog pedals, there's like an art form to just the build of it, the construction of it, the interface of it, and just kind of like the analog feeling of having your hands on niles and dobs, dip switches in some case, that almost feel like an extension of your instrument rather than plugging into a cold digital device and just getting whatever the presets are kind of approximating. So I'm a big fan of pedals. Uh, at my heart, I am kind of like a minimalist and I just want a good clean tone with like a cool overdrive or something. That's why that Mesa amp is fantastic. But I definitely love kind of just like the, the pedal community, which is also hilarious in its own right. So uh, I think pedals are definitely around to, say, to stay more and more. You know, you're seeing signature pedals for different artists kind of pop up. So it seems to be in a good place and it's just kind of, you know, a fun way to waste essentially all your money. Hey, hey, got a question answered. Just out of curiosity, what is your recommendation for a first looper pedal? I think the low end of the looper pedal market has never been better. I get a lot of people telling me that the really cheap, uh, you know, nicely priced looper pedals, like the Moore ones or some of the other off-brand ones, people seem to say that they do the job really well. Uh, I've never actually tried one of those myself, but I know Ian uses one and, you know, he says it's fine. Uh, the Boss one's great. I see a lot of people use the TC Electronic Ditto. That kind of seems to be uh, the, the staple in the market right now, so I would recommend that one. Now, I have the Pigtronics Infinity Looper, and the reason I have one of the more expensive ones is because it allows you to do different phrases. So if, I'm, if I want to do a playthrough for a whole song, I can record like the chord progression for maybe like the verse, 
in one loop, no matter how long that is, you know, it still has like a lot of time in it. And then I can do like maybe like a chorus progression for like a different part. And then I can switch back and forth between those and kind of do a playthrough for an entire song that isn't the same progression. So to me, that's like a valuable feature in a looper. And that's one of the benefits of having like maybe one of like a, like a dual button or even more uh, thing. But like I said, it seems like the cheaper stuff is doing really well. So whatever you can afford is a loop pedal that you should get. For listening homework, I'm gonna throw you to a cool track by a band called Foxygen. Uh, I definitely dig their newer stuff. It's been out for a little while, but uh, I think it's worth a listen. So if you have any questions or comments, definitely check that out and hit me up in the comment section, Instagram, Twitter, or the website, and I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks a lot.